All right, what's up guys, what's growing on? So I'm getting all kinds of epic videos here today. This one um, is an unbelievable staple crop. This is a video I made with Rob Greenfield. I think we harvested a 165 pound tuber. Um, this is one that Josh has some really epic kind of select varieties on I just got from him recently. We're gonna be planting a new yam teepee at the farm. I'll be bringing you guys a video on that here really soon. Um, but what I think is awesome about the videos we're getting here with Josh today, not only are we harvesting these and talking about propagation and how we started these, we're gonna be finishing the process in the kitchen with his wife, Emily. So really epic stuff going on here today. Hold tight. All right, so we're looking at uh, true yams. So in our culture, we've got a big mix up with sweet potatoes and yams um, you can buy sweet potato it's canned sweet potato but it says on it yams and uh, they're very different plants they're not related at all and uh, this is a, a mix-up that's I think mostly in American culture a lot of the tropical um, countries are familiar with both and they eat both um, so sweet potatoes sprawl on the ground and yams are climbing vines and when we're talking about yams, we're talking about the group Dioscoria, which of Dioscorias, there's about 600 species. 60 of those species are edible, and about 10 of them are major food crops. So when you say yam, it might be a very different thing if you're talking to somebody from Brazil or from uh, Senegal, West Africa, or you know, different countries grow different species of yams. And within those species, there's many different varieties. Um, so they're t generally they're they're big climbing vines and they're native to forested habitats. They climb up to the top of tree canopies, and so you can grow them in a semi-forested situation. Um, and they're big starchy tubers that basically taste like potatoes. They come in all different colors, and they're typically grow to be enormous. We've harvested from one plant here, uh, 139 pound yam. Uh, they're unique from the other root crops in that you can leave them in the ground for as many years as you want. The, all the others degrade in quality. They get real uh, woody. The cassav, or I'm sorry, the yams you can leave in the ground and they'll just get larger and larger and larger. Year three, you're looking at 100 pound tubers coming out of the ground, and all of that will still be good to eat and edible. Um, so this one right here is a. Uh, this is African yam, Dioscoria rotundata. This one's lesser known. Um, it doesn't uh, produce typically as much as some of the other ones, but this is a special variety. I tried quite a few of these different varieties of this one. This one's from Colombia, and it produces very well. Um, I'll get a tuber about this big on each plant. And it's very smooth, nice tuber, and it's also tastier than a lot of the other yams. Very starchy and rich. So this one's got a, uh, a real spiny stem. And uh, unlike some of the other varieties, it doesn't produce um, bulbs up in the air like some of the other species do. Um, so I would say of, of the tastiest favorite ones to eat that we grow here, this would be my number one, but it's, it, it's slow to reproduce. So I'm still building up the material to plant more. Um, and it's a little less yielding than some of the other varieties we can look at. Um, so if we come over here, we've got another species. That one's Dioscoria rotundata, which also, that one will include the yellow yams that they grow in Jamaica and West Africa. This one is still dormant. So one of the, one of the traits of, of yams is that they can't be grown any time of the year. So if you go to the tropics, you can visit a cassava farm and the same farm could have a patch of cassava that's knee-high, some that's ready to harvest, some that's just been planted, um, because it, it's not tied to the weather cycles that um, intimately. Yams are very different. They um, grow on a very particular cycle. You can't trick them into growing or sprouting when they're not ready. So here in Florida, that's basically April to December. In April, they sprout up out of the ground or you know, March, April, May, depending on the variety. And December, they die back. It's nothing that you've done to kill them. They, they naturally die back. And in the middle of that growing uh, dormant season, you can't get them to grow no matter what you do. They're on an internal timer. Uh, so this one's called Dioscoria esculentum. It's also spiny. 
And uh, I think this one has a lot of potential because rather than producing giant yams, which a lot of people don't want to deal with a giant 30 pound root at home, this one produces clusters of more potato sized pieces. It's really uh, interesting. Lesser known one. Kind of more like a, almost like the way a sweet potato or something would produce. See, this guy's just waking up for spring. See that, there's a, a sprout right there. Once they decide to wake up, it'll grow and then it dies back. And even whether this is in the ground or sitting on my counter in my house, it'll sprout at the same time, which is really a, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, so you can see this thing goes way back to here. There's probably 50 or more of these hiding under here. So this is kind of a fun one. I'd like to get more varieties of this, but this one's kind of hard to come by. And then let's look over here. This is Dioscoria alata. This is the most productive of the species you can grow here. Um, now you notice it has to, the yams have to grow on a trellis. This is gonna go up this pole and then up into this tree. And the more space it has to climb, the more photosynthesis can, it can do the more tuber production you get. These I'm gonna leave in the ground for two years, so when I dig them up, they'll probably be about 25 pounds each, and they're at a two foot spacing. 25, 50, 75, 100. You can get a lot of production on a small space with these. So they're just waking up for spring, and see what I mean about this shoot coming out. They come out of the ground very strong, and in, in a matter of two weeks, this will be up, to, up in that tree. It's like, uh, because all the starch exits the tuber and goes up into the vegetative growth. When the plant starts dying back in the fall, all the starch comes out of the leaves and goes down into the tuber. It's a storage mechanism to survive dry seasons uh, in the wild. So you can only really harvest these during that season when they're dormant. Otherwise, it's a shriveled up small tuber. There's all the starch is up in the plant at that time. Um, so in storage, you keep breaking these off otherwise it'll start to grow in in your kitchen um, and you got to keep snapping those off until you've eaten it all um, this one produces the aerial bulbs which you can plant uh, or typically what we do now is we plant a section of the top of the plant um, a piece about this big the researcher Dr. Franklin Martin, who used to work for the USDA, wrote these great documents about yams. He said to plant a piece the size of a man's fist. So about that big. I actually plant them a little bigger. The more, the larger the planting piece, the larger the yield, because the more energy that that piece starts with, the quicker it can take off and make a bigger canopy and ultimately produce more uh, starch. These are a lot like a potato to eat and they're incredible in how long they can store. It's like the opposite of cassava. You can dig this up in December and just even set it on your porch, not in the air conditioning, and they will last for four or five. I've, I've even eaten them as late as June, dug, in, dug out of the ground in December, six months later. Also, you can chop a piece off, because you can't eat a big 30 pound tuber all at once. You chop a piece off and the exposed surface will callus over and, and won't really rot. So you can eat it piece by piece over a period of time. You can boil this and make mashed potatoes. You can, we, make, we like to um, pan fry it in the morning and make like uh, home fries. You can do basically anything you would do with a potato. And this, after cassava, cassava is probably our most easy to grow number one productive root crop in Florida. The yams are number two. Um, the, the thing that makes them a bit of a challenge is you have to grow them on a trellis which is why around the world where they grow yams, it's losing ground to cassava because farmers have to put in so much work to build these trellises that they prefer to just grow cassava because you can just stab it in the ground and be done. Um, there's a great documentary people could check out called Our Roots. If you search Our Roots Vanuatu, like the country on YouTube, there's this great documentary all about um, yams and other root crops in Vanuatu. Um, and there's a great book called Gardens of Oceania um, that talks a lot about yams. There's a whole number of great um, books. And this is a whole world you can delve into because there's so many varieties of yams. They're really kind of an addictive thing to collect and grow. Um, some of this one, this variety, some of these come in a deep purple hue and they come out of the ground looking very different than this one. 
Typically this species has square stems, but this variety comes out of the ground with round stems. There's some others right here we could look at. Um, some other varieties. I'm experimenting with growing these in giant pots right at the base of a tree um, in order to use this tree. That This is a native persimmon that doesn't, the fruit's really nasty. So by putting them in these pots, um, they won't get all tangled up with the roots of the persimmon and we can just dump the pot over to harvest. So this one is an alata variety. So this species um, has square stems typically and the leaves come out in pairs. This is the winged yam or the greater yam or water yam or there's a whole lot of different names. It gets really confusing when you get into these. This is a uh, another type of rotundata, African yam. See the other one was spiny, this one's not really spiny. So see there's a lot of variation in these. And then this one is yellow yam. Um, another variety of rotundata. Super spiny. And see all the foliage on this one is all compact. This one just went right up the tree. So they, they really vary a lot from one to the next and not all of them produce well. I'm always growing new ones. You can just buy them from the store and plant them. So if you go to uh, Asian um, grocery stores, African grocery stores, Caribbean grocery stores, buy the tubers, plant them and evaluate them. And if it's a good one, it produces well, you can name it and start sharing it with people and um, start growing it. All right, so here's some yams that were harvested a few weeks ago. They've just been sitting on my porch. They totally will stay good, kept like that, which is really cool. Um, I would say this is a nice sized yield here. Any bigger than this, they're, you know, they, they get hard to dig out of the ground. This guy's probably like eight pounds or something. These are actually the same variety, but you can get all these different shapes. Um, I'm after yams that are very smooth and easy to peel because these get to be a bit of a annoyance in the kitchen. But you can see here, they're very beautiful white flesh. And um, you'll see here, if I do this, it's, it's real slimy. But that completely goes away when it's cooked. Um, if there's still slime after you've cooked it, it's not fully cooked. When it's fully cooked, it'll be just like a potato. All that slime disappears. Um, so in terms of a good um, planting piece, this would be one right here. So we've already eaten this yam. This was probably a nice big one. And uh, that's mostly healed up, so it's not rotting too bad. And the, when the sprout starts to come out like that, it's telling you I'm ready to go in the ground. Uh, right now, April 20, whatever it is, this is a perfect date to plant. So I would put this just under the ground. I might even put it kind of a little bit cockeyed like that and just cover that sprout with soil. And uh, in, in just a week, you'll see that coming up out of the ground and starting to take off. Um, these white ones, we think taste a lot better than the purple ones. The purple ones are more productive, but I think there's less starch in them. So I think it's a trade off. There's a lot more water content in them. So they're swollen up. They're not necessarily more productive when it comes to food value. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is like a nice 50 pound bin here. You can easily produce this much yam. Uh, they're really one of the best staple foods you can grow in Florida. They have this advantage of being able to store forever. So for about half the year, you can, you can be eating on these. And we don't need to be um, trucking in potatoes from across the world. Hi, I'm hey. Emily. I'm the kitchen manager at Heart. And um, I've got some yams here. I'm going to show you how to process and uh, turn into yam waffles. Ooh. So um, I took my root outside and washed it off really well. Um, you want to find where the growing point is. And we cut off a big chunk so that we can replant it. Pretty big size piece. We go fist size or bigger and then okay yams are pretty gnarly and can be a pain in the butt to peel so um, I like to cut them into smaller sized pieces anywhere that you have these like two shoots coming off I cut right down the center of those 
kind of split those in half so that way you're not trying to get in those nooks and stuff and keep the root hole. I just cut it into small pieces so it's more manageable. Um, it can be really hard to peel these with a vegetable peeler. If you're into that, cool. I just peel it with my knife like this. And if I lose a little bit of extra flesh, it's not a big deal to me because we have more yams than we know what to do with. So to me, that's the easiest way to peel it is to just do that. And also um, some of these roots um, kind of go deeper into the flesh. So if you are just peeling off the uh, just a really thin layer around the skin, you might end up with uh, kind of like woody spots in your, that part doesn't look very good. You might end up with kind of woody spots in your, in your cut up roots anyway. So I just kind of scrape it and cut away at it like that. Some of the better varieties are not so knobby and twisted. Yeah, I mean the best the best bet is to find a variety that grows nice and smooth and straight and doesn't have all of these little roots and that's definitely ideal. But if all you have is these more gnarly ones then I just I value uh the easiness of just kind of roughly doing this rather than trying to be really tedious to me it's not worth the little bit of root that you save if i try to be super tedious and not waste any of the flesh i'm not gonna eat yams <laughs> so yeah um different. even when you wash them outside they still get really dirty hard to get it all off. So they're really slimy to work with once they're peeled. Um, yeah, they're kind of hard to hold in your hand and peel with a peeler. That's why I like to cut a flat surface and set them down because um, they just, they get so slimy, they just slip right out of your hands. From there, you can dice them up and boil them and in a soup or something. You can make mashed yams just like mashed potatoes. Um, pretty much anything you can do with a potato you can do with this. Um, if you don't, some yams are slimier than others. So I've had issues with the purple yam basically no matter how I cook them, but purple ube yam that's vibrant purple and really pretty, but um, to me they're just always slimy. Um, and I don't love that slime. So for me, the purple yam, I mostly just use for sweets and desserts and kind of the more traditional Filipino ube dishes and stuff like that. Um, but with the white yams, if you're wanting to eat them as a staple crop, yeah, I recommend other yams other than the ube. Unless you're gonna turn it into flour, a lot of people do that. But I recently started doing something that's a little, uh, non-traditional, less like a potato, um, I started turning them into waffles. So um, here I have, I have two different batters that I've mixed up. This one is pureed yam. You can see it turned brown from um, oxidation. They tend to brown really easily. Um, different varieties brown at different rates. This one happened to brown very quickly. So, um, What do you mix in? This is just baking powder and an egg, and you could add um, mashed banana or sugar, sweetener or whatever if you want. So this would be more like a traditional waffle. I cubed up the yams and put them in my blender raw and blended it into this paste. So I have a pretty high powered blender. I have a Vitamix, and so it blends up really smooth, and I have to add almost no liquid to it. Um, I haven't done it yet with a lower powered blender, so that would be something you'd have to experiment with. I don't know. You might have to add a little more liquid, um, but I'm sure it would work fine. Oh, 
really didn't oil it, I bet it's gonna stick. Oh. <laughs> Over here, I have a sourdough yam waffle where I did the same thing. I put the, the yam in the blender and pureed it, but I took a little bit of my sourdough starter and added it to it. And I did that this morning and it's been sitting on the stove with a pilot light on it. And you can see it's got some nice bubbles in there. Um, so I use this as more of a savory waffle. And with this, it, it's, it's kind of like hash browns, like sourdough hash browns. <laughs> That's kind of what it tastes like. Okay, so here is the sourdough waffle. And we're gonna make a third one. This batter has sugar and oil in it as well as egg and baking powder. So it's, it will be the most like a traditional waffle. Mm. All right, so this is the third one with the, the egg, the oil, and the sweetener. And it's gonna taste most like a traditional waffle. Okay. All right, should we put a blindfold on you? Whoa, Whoa. can you tell me which one's which? <laughs> Here, eat this one. Which one is it? I don't know. It tastes good. <laughs> it's yam with baking powder and egg. Okay. Tastes fine. Yeah. Kind of bland. That one's better. That sourdough? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot tastier. Oh, wow, that is. That's a lot better. Ooh. That other one was boring. Yeah. That's good. That one's actually pretty good. Mm. That one's like a funnel cake. Really? <laughs> So this is the one with the egg, the oil, that one's and the delicious. sweetener, and the baking powder. So it, it definitely tastes the most like a traditional waffle. And it's lighter, fluffier. Yeah. Not dense or chewy. The other two are a little bit dense, a little bit chewy. Yeah, waffles. This one you could get picky kids to eat. Oh, this is good. Yeah. Mm. Mm hmm. Wow, you could eat that by itself. It's yeah. nice. All right, now we're gonna eat these miracle fruits and then taste, taste the sourdough ones and see if they Whoa. taste. And I'm gonna eat two, so I'm super miracle fruited up. We do a second one. I got you, yeah. Flavor tripping on yam waffles, I like it. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Which, that's the sourdough. This is the sourdough one. It doesn't taste as good. Yeah. <laughs> no, that didn't work. What the heck? <laughs> it's not as good, really? No, it just tastes like the, like the. Boring You're right, one. you don't taste the fermentation. You don't taste the sourness at all. <laughs> All right, how's the funnel cake? It still tastes like funnel cake. No difference there either? Yeah, it's sweeter. Hmm. This one's the best. It's definitely the most waffle-like. This, or er, the sourdough one would be good. Almost like sandwich bread. Nice. Wing. Yeah. Oh, good job, Emily. Whoa, so yam wow. This is another exciting crop to grow here in Florida. Another one that thrives on neglect. Like I mentioned in the last video, Josh now has a blog. He's writing about these crops that he's experimenting with. Definitely come out here to Heart and check them out. They have a nursery here on site. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to hit that like button. Most importantly, pound dirt.